right, so we'll, uh, we're having a bit of an unusual session. Um, homage to Professor Theophil Kiss for his 90th uh, birthday. I believe we may have a representative of the Kiss family in the room, Yuri. Thank you for coming. Um, but this is also kind of a sad event because Professor Kiss' health is not good, not good at all. Um, so he couldn't be with us, but he is with us in spirit. Professor McCarrick saw him a few days ago, so Yuri uh, saw him on a daily basis. Um, so the, um, the idea is to tell uh, the story of Professor Kiss and also the story of, the, of Ukrainian studies that eventually became the chair of Ukrainian studies, but the Ukrainian studies program here at the University of Ottawa, because um, the two uh, biographies intersect uh, a great deal. Um, Professor Kiss was born in um, Ukraine, Western Ukraine, at a very young age, 1617. He uh, was displaced like uh, an entire cohort, an entire generation, and so ended up in, in Europe and then couldn't return to Ukraine uh, for 50 years, which is the usual story of the, the DP uh, generation. But he made his way eventually to Belgium um, and got a degree at Université Catholique de Louvain in the early 60s. So Professor Kiss, um, unlike, I mean, it's kind of a, a minority a story in, in um, the, the history of uh, Ukrainian immigration to, to Canada, became then a Francophone Ukrainian. Not that he didn't speak English, but uh, he got educated in French. Um, and then eventually came here, and as I'll say in a moment, University of Ottawa well, is still bilingual, but was primarily, primarily a French Catholic university, certainly when he uh, arrived. Um, so he got his degree at Université Catholique de Louvain, who was a bilingual university, so from one bilingual university to another, uh, because Louvain is now Leuven. Um, he left uh, before uh, nationalism split the university in two, and Université Catholique de Louvain became, uh, well, the equivalent in Dutch, and uh, the French part of the university moved to Louvain-la-Neuve. So that's the story of Belgium, when you have like homogenous uh, French now in Dutch territories. Is um, he wrote a dissertation on the incorporation of Eastern European states to the Soviet Union. Uh, Soviet regimes type. He was his lifelong interest as an academic was on regimes. He uh, actually wrote uh, a book on federalism, first on Canadian federalism, being in Ottawa. And uh, in the 60s, when things were brewing, and the uh, official uh, language act here in Canada was in uh, 1969, uh, so kind of a renewed federalism and eventually a book on federalism in uh, Soviet Ukraine, or Soviet federalism, as applied to a situation in what was then Soviet Ukraine. Um, he had broader interest in comparative politics. Uh, he wrote even uh, articles on convergence theory that was trendy in the, in the 70s as to whether the Soviet and Western models would eventually uh, get closer uh, together. Um, and eventually, this, his interest in regimes led him to a, uh, a passion and to constitutionalism. And he became even active, I'm told, in the 90s. Well, he wrote quite a bit on uh, Ukrainian constitutional issues. But then Ukrainian ado Ukraine adopted a constitution in 96, and apparently he was involved as a uh, consultant or advisor. Um, so Professor Kiss, after he got his degree in, in Belgium, uh, moved to Canada at a time where the University of Ottawa and specifically the political science department was hiring. So he was part of like the growth, the early growth of my department, which eventually became the School of Political Studies. Um, a generation that I, I kind of arrived at the tail end. Professor Keyes had retired already, but was still active on campus. Uh, but his colleagues had either just retired or, or I knew them for a few years. They were like the, the heydays of the political science uh, uh, department. 
But he also came to um, a university that had a tradition in Ukrainian studies. Now, it turns out that Louvain also had that tradition. I learned uh, from our local archivist here that Metropolitan Sheptitsky actually uh, was instrumental in creating some kind of Ukrainian studies program in Louvain in the 1920s. Uh, you know, the kind of the Catholic international here, <laughs> Greek Catholics, University Catholique. And um, so when Professor Kiss then studied, uh, he uh, it was not just a political or social science department, there was a Ukrainian studies presence. And at the University of Ottawa, um, which was a Catholic university, we actually had a Catholic uh, president until the 1980s, before the secularization of this institution, which again was, it used to be mostly French by a ratio of two to one, and now it's mostly English by a ratio of two to one, but in, not in aggregate terms, just in proportion because the university is much larger than it used to be. So there was, uh, because of the Catholic angle, a whole generation of um, refugees from World War II, mostly, if not overwhelmingly, from Western Ukraine, that came here and got an education, even in Ukrainian, I'm told, in the late 40s and 50s here at the university. A whole cohort of library scientists was even uh, trained at the University of Ottawa. So that's that, that, the, and one of the, well, the driving force academically was this Professor Bida in the Department of Literature that eventually, as we're getting to closer to the story, will, you know, endow or provide the found financial foundations for the endowment of the chair. So when Professor Kiss arrives here in, in the mid-60s, there's already this tradition of Ukrainian studies. Uh, but coming from, again, the the religious aspect of it, the fact that it was a Catholic institution, but that, and then the tradition will evolve into an academic uh, uh, pursuit. And uh, that's at this point that I would like to turn to my colleague, if you could take a microphone here, uh, Irena, and tell us about the early days, 70s and 80s, of uh, Ukrainian studies around Professor Kiss. Okay, um, my uh, acquaintance with Professor Keese goes back to 1981 uh, when I was hired by the English department. I'm, I'm a Shakespearean by training. I had come from Toronto with my husband to take up this position. And uh, I had missed Toronto very much because I was very active in the Ukrainian community there. And at a Ukrainian event here in Ottawa, I met uh, Teofil Kiss who invited me to be part of the Ukrainian Endowment and Research Advisory Committee. I had wanted very much to meet Konstantin Bida because he was a, a professor of literature, and of course that was uh, more in my area than political science, but he had just passed away before I arrived. So I was very disappointed by that. Uh, P professor Bida had produced the first anthology of Ukrainian and Quebecois poetry in parallel translation. And it, it's a wonderful book uh, that shows an interest in contemporary literature, uh, Ukrainian, and in, in uh, Francophone literature. And I was impressed that Teofil was not only interested in political science, but he was very interested in contemporary poetry. He was very knowledgeable about it. Uh, he knew uh, the New York group of poets. He uh, was particularly fond of uh, a Munich poet called Emma Andievska, a very difficult poet. Uh, he loved opera. He loved um, gardening. He, he was very good at uh, growing orchids, for example. He was wide-ranging in his interest, uh, a gentleman uh, of the, uh, the European model, uh, extremely witty, sometimes uh, uh, you know, very pointedly witty and even mischievous in that respect. And he invited me to join this endowment fund, which had been set up when Professor Bida died. So Professor Bida came in 1957 and created the first Slavic department at the University of Ottawa. And so it wasn't just Ukrainian studies, it was Russian, Polish, and Ukrainian. 
and he served as uh, the chair of the first uh, Department of Slavic Studies until 1979. Uh, Professor Bida uh, was uh, European educated. Uh, uh, Vienna uh, University is, was his home. And he was passionate about Ukrainian literature. He had established a program with all three degrees, BA, MA, and PhD. And upon his uh, death, he left his whole estate to the University of Ottawa and to the creation of the Ukrainian Endowment Fund. This fund is what has created this chair. So you could come and do all your degrees, and people did, from across North America, from Europe, uh, from South America. Uh, to uh, study Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainian literature and linguistics. And the endowment committee uh, was chaired by Professor Kies, who is also the trustee of the uh, BIDA fund. And it involved also a Bohdan Plaskac, who was a linguist, and Senator Yuzik, Senator Paul Yuzik. So it, it's curious that the chair of Ukrainian studies, which you have right now, was created by no one who was in the Ukrainian department. And people working totally as volunteers. There was no political science in Ukrainian. Uh, Professor Kis was a comparativist. He was very interested in Ukraine's relation in the world, international relations, comparative politics. He was anti-reductionist. He wanted to have scholars study Ukraine, Ukraine in a holistic manner, so he was very pleased when the Danilu seminars came about because we're looking at um, various topics in Ukraine from sociological point of view, anthropological, uh, political, legal, and, and, and literary. Uh, thank you for that uh, wonderful talk about the whole Holodomor, that was fascinating. So this is exactly the kind of interest that he had, and in that sense, he was carrying on the legacy of Professor Bida. We worked many years together uh, on the endowments committee, uh, uh, putting out many publications, creating conferences. There was a journal, a trilingual journal, Studio Krinika, so French, English, and Ukrainian. Uh, we had a bulletin uh, that came out once our, our chair was founded in 1995, before we had a chairholder, also in three languages. And what I learned uh, working with him on those projects was not only that he was an exacting scholar, uh, but he was what he would call a constructivny pessimist, a constructive pessimist, always looking at uh, an angle that, that could be attacked, that, that might be um, always looking with a critical eye at everything. Not an idealist, but he was hopeful for the future and hopeful for Ukraine, but recognizing all the flaws that existed uh, both then and in the past. He was not someone who was nostalgic, looking back, but always looking forward. I'd call him a modernist in, in, in many respects, not only because of the fact that he was interested in contemporary politics and contemporary literature, contemporary film, uh, but always looking to the future. The uh, endowment fund uh, was I think he was extremely wisely. Uh, Theophile was very prudent about public money and uh, also very careful about um, the presentation of the University of Ottawa and Ukrainian studies within it. And sometimes our meetings went on way too long, three to four hours as he, he was parsing uh, a sentence in English, French, or Ukrainian. He was careful about all three languages. So this led to some tensions when I was really wanting to go home at 6.30 and we were still working out how this should sound. Uh, I think that attention to language uh, was evident when he worked on the Ukrainian constitution because he actually drafted parts of it, if not the whole thing. Uh, it's been a while now since we talked about that particular issue, but he was very, very careful about the power of language. And so that transferred uh, into the kind of detailed work that he, he did uh, in that case, but also, of course, in, in his scholarly articles. It became evident after a while that uh, we needed to do something more than have just an advisory committee, uh, more than simply put together publications. And so um, uh, Theophile and myself decided that we would create a chair of Ukrainian studies and that if we built it, they would come, and they have. Uh, 
Uh, and one of my former students, uh, now a professor at Kiev Mohila Academy, Roman Veritelnik, was also uh, an assistant in this. We hired Irene Bell, that you all know uh, as someone very active in the Ottawa community, as our first coordinator. And we had a, 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 an important launch in 1995. After that, we had a number of conferences towards a, U, a new Ukraine, a one, two, and three. So in subsequent years, 1996, 7, 8, no, 97, 8, and 2000, I believe, uh, three conferences, all SHRC funded, so external funding, trying to keep the endowment in place. And we had an additional fund, the Ivachnyuk Fund. Um, uh, Antin Ivachnyuk uh, finished his master's of uh, uh, literary studies here at the university, and he also left a substantial amount to the chair. So with these two founding endowments, uh, we discussed with the administration of the university the possibility to create a chair. We didn't have sufficient funds, but nonetheless, they let us go forward. And thought that once we had a chair holder, things would start to take off. And indeed, that's what happened. And uh, we continued to, uh, to publish. And then we hired um, Dominique. And of course, the, the whole terrain changed. It shifted from literary studies. Uh, this was also a topic of much debate. What kind of chair should we have? Should it be a chair of literature? Uh, not a chair of history, because that already existed. Uh, the chair of folklore was about to be created in, in the Western Canada, in Edmonton. And eventually, uh, it was decided that we would make one a chair focused on contemporary Ukraine in all its different facets, and uh, with a special emphasis on political science. So that's how it came about. And uh, our meetings uh, began to dwindle in terms of the length, <laughs> and uh, it became perhaps more efficient. And we were glad to pass on the, the torch to Dominique, who has uh, kept up the, the interest in an interdisciplinary comparative way. Uh, Irina. Uh of course, the, the, the chair as an institution, uh, as you mentioned, was formally launched in 1995 under the patronage of former Governor General Natishin, himself a fourth generation Ukrainian from uh, Bukovina. Um, you came in the early 80s, Bida, uh, Professor Bida passed away late 70s, um, leaving money for, again, an, an, an endowment for a future program. But there was still some vibrancy between 1980 and 1995 in terms of Ukrainian studies. Before the chair, if you could uh, see a few words about that, with Professor Kiss obviously at the center of things. Well, yes and no. Uh, uh, that is, he was at the center on this advisory committee, but he was not teaching in the Ukrainian program, neither was I. I I'm in the English department, <laughs> as I have continued uh, since 1981, and he was in the political science department. So there were courses that were being offered in Ukrainian, uh, but eventually the PhD program was closed down, and thereafter the, the master's program, there were insufficient students. Uh, they did not have a, uh, a professor. I did uh, a little bit. I was cross-appointed for three years to the Slavic program. But that was really just filling a gap. Uh, so in fact, there was no one on the founding committee of the chair who was actually in the Ukrainian program, in, which is now part of the modern language uh, and uh, literatures program. But in terms of, we have this annual lecture called the Ivan Franco lecture mm -hmm. that predates the creation uh, of, or the launching of the chair by uh, about a decade. Oh yes, uh, so, so we were yeah. involved in doing all yes. those things on top of our regular uh, load. Yes. In that was my own, question. That in our kind own of departments, yeah, that yes. kind of activities. Yeah, yeah. so the Ivan Franco and I mentioned publications and the journal and the mm -hmm. bulletins. All of those continued to be uh, performed as tasks that uh, we would do for the fun of it, uh, for, for the love of Ukrainian studies. So extraordinary things happen in, uh, in Ukraine from the late 80s on, with Perestroika, Glasnost, and then independence. Um, now, you're Canadian-born, of Ukrainian background, but Professor Kiss, as we mentioned, is Ukraine-born and couldn't go back for 50 years. You must have had conversations with him in the 90s or late 80s, how he actually, you know, you said he was a, uh, how did you put it, a cons 
constructively pessimist. That's it, constructive a constructive pessimist. pessimist. <laughs> uh, it must have been very emotional for, for him to, to see these profound changes happening. It, it was, and actually we celebrated together, uh, whether by accident or not, we, we ended up living in the same area, so we, one block away from each other. Um, Senator Paul Yuzik uh, lived uh, in the other direction, also another block, so we had a kind of little Ukrainian ghetto there. Uh, and uh, it, just by accident, uh, we, we passed uh, his house when the, the Berlin Wall fell. So we were celebrating that evening, and then similar uh, event when the, the referendum came out for an independent Ukraine. And yes, it was emotional, but uh, again, I would suggest that he's not um, nostalgic. I mean, you wouldn't see him you know, cry openly or something like that. He was restrained. Uh, I would say almost in, in a kind of English manner, an, an English gentleman. But evidently, this, this was a moving moment. And uh, I do recall that he met his brother for the first time in 50 years when he traveled to, to Ukraine. So to this, I think perhaps his family could speak uh, with, with, with greater, uh, uh, in greater detail. And uh, his son, Yura, is here, one of his two sons, Osip and, and uh, Yura. Um, I don't know, would you like to say something about this, Yuri? The emotional response of your father to we, we independent need, Ukraine. We need a microphone. I'm putting him on the spot here. Sabrina, a microphone for Mr. Kiss. Yes. Um, I think you pretty much um, got it right. He was, he's not a really um, overly emotional, he, well, he overly emotional pe person. He, um, uh, he would restrain his emotions. So I think you're correct. I don't remember there being a, a, a big hurrah coming from him, but I do remember you coming over and, <laughs> and having drinks. So That's right. And he liked his martinis cold. Yeah. He did. <laughs> yeah. I, I should say, too, um, Teofil loved Canada. And what I remember, we were talking about celebrations of, of Ukraine and the fall of the Berlin Wall. But I also remember that they had an annual celebration of the day when they arrived in Canada. And I thought that was very uh, telling, that he wasn't, again, looking back. But what has happened here was important for his life, his career, his future, his children. Uh, and he could look at Ukraine uh, both with geographical distance and I think with um, scholarly rigor and, and a dispassionate understanding of what was happening. You remember those uh, annual events? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> he was small. <laughs> you mentioned uh, Senator Yuzik for the benefit of the audience here who would, would know this very important uh, character, politician, and it's his relation to uh, well, multiculturalism more broadly and, mm -hmm. and the chair or the Ukrainian studies program here at the university, if you could say a, a few words. Well, he was a, an active part of the, the committee. He was one of the founders of the, the whole concept of multiculturalism in Canada. Uh, he was originally a teacher in a one-room schoolhouse in the West. Um, he was very proud of that and proud of the way that, that he'd managed to become a senator in Canada. Um, he was a you know, pleasant person to work with. So, I, I, so I he was active in these years, in the 80s and the 90s, leading uh, to the, the creation forgotten, of the chair? Yeah, I've forgotten exactly when he passed away, but by the time we were ready to create the chair, he was gone. Yeah, But he would come to our advisory committee about once a month. Mm -hmm. In fact, he used his Senate office to photocopy stuff for the chair. So don't, don't, don't say that <laughs> to anybody else. Just keep it under your hat. <laughs> Again, for the benefit of the audience, uh, I mentioned in passing the Official Language Act, uh, you had uh, Canada was going through uh, fundamental changes in the 60s and 70s and that was connected in part with the, the rise of nationalism in Quebec. and. Uh, so French and English became official languages uh, in 1969. Um, as a, um, and from the, the Quebec perspective, the, the narrative, let's say a, a dominant narrative in Quebec is that of two founding nations, 
the French and the English, and therefore that should be reflected in federal institutions. That's the short story. Mm -hmm. But of course, the story of Canada after the founding nation is also a story of uh, settlement, well, first of expansion of Canada from what became eventually Quebec and Ontario and the Maritimes all the way to, uh, to the West. And of course, it's a story in particular of Ukrainian immigration and other peoples. And so that's, again, in a nutshell, is this the alternative narrative or the complementary narrative, which is, can be politically contentious, certainly in Quebec, but is the reality in Canada and that of multiculturalism. So you had the Multiculturalism Act in 71, so again consecutive to the Official Language Act, where the Ukrainian community in particular played the, a leading role, um, which um, again, uh, beyond the narrative, actually provided funding for uh, educational, even uh, education in, in, in minority languages, both at the federal and provincial level. And, and then Senator Yuzik uh, was a major uh, actor mm -hmm. in this whole, again, national process. So that gives you kind of the, the historical context that eventually led to uh, the chair of Ukrainian studies. So I should just say that uh, Tofilikis is now in hospital and uh, he's not doing very well, but we're all thinking of him. And I'm very glad that uh, Yurikis was here. He's come from Vancouver uh, to, to see his father. And uh, we wish Teofil all the best and Mnohayalita. And Netiki Mnohayalita. We used to joke uh, as we were working uh, long hours on some of these uh, academic projects Ukraina Nikola Nizabude. Ukraine will never forget you. Uh, and we meant that ironically, because of course, institutional memory is short. And it's a pleasure today to remember the work that he has done, the foundational work which has permitted this seminar to exist and this chair to exist. Thank you. Thank you, Irina. Thank you, Irina.